support of our members. So please raise your hand if you are a member of the Commonwealth Club. All right. Well, thank you so much for your support. You're the reason why we've lasted 115 years. And here's to another 115 more. So welcome to our new building. I also want to welcome our uh, digital viewers. We are live streaming on Facebook right now. My name's Kimberly Moss. I'm the Vice President of Development, and it's always my pleasure to welcome such a nice, full, sold-out audience to a great program at the Commonwealth Club. Please silence your cell phones. Just take a minute to make sure those are uh, turned off. Double check, and while you do so, I'll tell you about some upcoming Commonwealth Club programs. On February 15th, Bloomberg's Emily Chang joins us in Santa Clara to talk about tackling the Silicon Valley's pervasive boys club culture. On March 5th, Arlie Hochschild sits down to discuss her book, Strangers in Their Own Land, and how the political divide in America is more bridgeable than we might think. March 7th, we have Amy Chua, best-selling author of the book, Battle Him of the Tiger Mother, and she comes to talk about political tribalism. All right, for today's program, uh, if you have questions for Mr. Frum, our guest, please write your question on the question cards. These, these are on your seats, and these will be collected throughout the program and brought to our moderator, Scott Schaefer, senior editor of KQED's California P Politics and Government Desk, and he will get to them, as, as many of them as possible. Mr. Frum's new book, Trumpocracy, uh, it's available for purchase outside of the room after the program, and he'll be happy to sign your, your copy. I'll remind everyone that the Commonwealth Club is a nonpartisan organization, and we ask that our speakers be allowed to make their remarks without interruption. Lastly, I just want to give a thanks to United Airlines for helping to bring Mr. Frum to San Francisco today. And now, please give a warm welcome to David Frum and Scott Schaefer. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome to the Commonwealth Club of California. You can find us online at commonwealthclub.org on Facebook and Twitter and on our YouTube channel as well. My name is Scott Schaefer, a senior editor of California Politics and Government at KQED. I'm very pleased to be your moderator for this afternoon's program. Joining us is David Frum, former Republican speechwriter, senior editor at The Atlantic, and author of the new book, Trumpocracy, the Corruption of the American Republic. David made a name for himself uh, in the George W. Bush administration as a speechwriter, where he coined the term, or helped coin the term, axis of evil. <laughs> Later, uh, he would write the first insider book on the Bush presidency. In this book, he discussed how the office of the president was limited not by law, but by tradition, propriety, and public outcry, as we're seeing. Alarmed by the imminent decline of democracy in America's internal affairs, David argues that the traditional limits placed on the presidency have been weakened by President Trump. In his book, Trumpocracy, David outlines how he thinks the president is degrading America's liberalism, the possible consequences for our nation and the world, as well as steps toward prevention. David, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. And what, what a pleasure to be here in San Francisco. I promise not to tell anybody how great it is. So the <laughs> and the, it's so distracted. The, seeing the bay back there is just like yeah, distracting. This, we'll this information cannot, cannot be allowed to. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to sort of start at the end because the conclusion of your book uh, is and I'm quoting here, we're living through the most dangerous challenge to the free government of the United States that anyone alive has encountered. So are you saying that this is sort of an existential threat for the nation? Uh, it is, a, the, the country's institutions are in real trouble, but I wanna make clear what the trouble is and what the trouble is not. Um, Donald Trump is not the heart attack of democracy, he is the gum disease of democracy. <laughs> you, you can, you can die from gum disease, but it doesn't happen instantly. Um, and it, doesn't, it only happens if it's allowed to fester. And the nature, again, of the, of the threat, I want to also be clear about this, that it, when Donald Trump was first elected, many people ha suggested some kind of dramatic comparison to the worst cases of democratic breakdown in history. 
But I don't regard um, the survival of democracy as a light switch on or off. It's a dial. Uh, and there are a lot of ways that democracy can degrade and decline without it reaching the very worst outcomes. The moderately bad outcomes are bad enough. And those are what? Moderately bad outcomes are what we see in places like Poland and Hungary, uh, what we see, are seeing in South Africa and India and, and um, Turkey, what we could see in France should the National Front win there. Um, and that is the gradual politicization of law enforcement, uh, the loss of independence of your judiciary, pre informal pressure brought to bear on the press, both through public pressure and also through private threat, uh, and um, the um, collapse of ethical standards that have relied on public opinion to uphold them. You can see this, and Hungary is really, I think in many ways, the, the model case. Hungary is a member of the European Union, a signatory to the European Convention on Human Rights, and the authoritarian leader of Hungary, Viktor Orban, has not wrongfully arrested a single person. But he has amassed a giant fortune. He has destroyed the integrity of law enforcement and of the courts. He has, uh, and he's put enormous pressure to bear on critics. Um, and effectively, he hasn't silent, those critics who write for very elite publications, they're left alone. But critics in TV, radio, social media, they come under pressure. So we've seen things like executive overreach. We've seen corruption. Richard Nixon, for example. Uh, FDR tried to pack the courts. Yeah. Uh, you know, we've seen these examples over the course of the country's history. Yeah. How does what's happening right now compare to those kinds of things? Well, I'm glad you put in historical perspective. That's where this all needs to be. So let me give you a somewhat longer view. Um, in order to fight the Depression, World War II, and the Cold War, um, we, the United States strengthened the presidency enormously. Uh, as the presidency got stronger, there were also terrible abuses. And many of the um, abuses that we collectively call Watergate all had their origins in earlier times. Richard Nixon asked to see his opponent's income tax returns. Franklin Delano Roosevelt genuinely got his opponent's income tax returns. What did he do with them? Um, he entertained dinner parties with embarrassing details. <laughs> From the, more seriously, more seriously, he pressured Joe Kennedy not to run for president in 1940 with information from Joe Kennedy would not have won. He wasn't a very correct, but that that was that, his ambassador at the time. Th wasn't that it? was the consolation prize. Uh, uh, if you know, if you if you don't run, I have a nice reward. If you do run, there are some disgraceful things in your past that I happen to know about. Yeah. Uh, uh, in in the same way, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, um, Richard Nixon did wiretap a nominated political opponent. Franklin Roosevelt wiretapped Charles Lindbergh, whom he was afraid would become a nominated opponent. So these things have antecedents. What happened in Watergate um, in that period was we, impo we imposed, uh, we took the post-Cold War presidency with all its powers and we put it under new constraints. And we said the FBI, the CIA, they, can no, they, they now must report to Congress as well as the president. We, uh, there, we need higher ethical standards. That's when the custom of uh, the president releasing his tax returns begins. That's when the law is passed requiring the president and the pre vice president to disclose financial information. And a series of habits develop, and they last for half a century. What we are seeing with Donald Trump, so it's not that what Donald Trump is doing is entirely unthought of in American history, but we are on one track from, the, from over the past 50 years, and we're now back on another track. And this time, unlike the very powerful presidents of the Cold War era, who, whatever you think about any particular thing, who are acting in, with a broad public vision in the context of deadly existential external threat to the United States, this time you have these powers being taken by a president who's interested in nothing but his own enrichment. So part of what you're saying then is that we are reverting back uh, to a time before Watergate when these traditions, as you describe them, became uh, common it, it, so are you saying what's happening now is normal? No, because here, here's the other difference between now and then, and here's the part that is really new. Um, in 1965, when the president was, had all of these incredible powers, it was all, Congress at that time was way more independent of the president, even if Congress and the president happened to share the same party affiliation. Jimmy Carter had a Democratic Congress through all four years. Bill Clinton had a Democratic Congress for his first two years. And yet in both cases, Congress did oversight, stop things the president wanted to do. Um, in, Jimmy Carter was made by a Democratic Congress by pressure from them to sell his peanut farm. 
That was not Republicans who made him do that. They, did, they, didn't have, they were in the minority in both houses. It was Democrats who said, you know, and we now regard this as a joke, but it was quite a substantial farm, and it, was, it was, could have received agricultural subsidies, and Congress said that you have to sell it uh, or divest yourself to other family members. Uh, what has happened now is at the same time as we are breaking the post-Watergate ethical restraints on the presidency, we're also seeing a new hyper-partisan unity between Congress and the president, where the old idea dating to the early days of the Republic that ambition would balance ambition, that Congress would be one thing and the presidency would be a different thing. We have seen checks over the and past balances. year, the checks and balances, are, which are a metaphor, not a law, they're not checking because Congress is acting not as an independent body, but as fellow Republicans who are trying to pass a common agenda and need to protect and empower a president of the same party. Well, let's talk about one of those uh, fellow Republicans, uh, Devin Nunes, who is a uh, congressman. Who may be regarded as an American hero. If... That's what uh, Trump, I think, tweeted, right? Uh, yeah. An upside down land. Yeah. Uh, so, um, you know, we've seen sort of appearance, his appearance on the White House lawn late at night. Uh, we've seen him uh, writing uh, a memo after it was approved by yeah. the uh, House Intelligence Committee. So, like, what's going on with Devin Nunes and with this memo? What's really happening? Well, again, I want to put this in a bit of perspective. Because I, I, know this is a, I know I'm talking to a group of people who understand well the workings of government and care a lot about it. The reason we have intelligence committees in the House and Senate, um, they were created after Watergate and after the discovery of uh, real abuses at the FBI and CIA because they said it's not enough to trust the president with the oversight of these bodies. Congress needs its own separate point of view. And historically, an appointment to these, it was a real, they're the only committees with equal numbers of people from both parties, at least the House and and, uh, and a tradition of bipartisan. Bipartisanship. I should say more nonpartisanship. Nonpart more equal numbers. I think there's always one more for the majority party, but it's not the kind of lopsidedness you see in other. And, and they, would they also behave a little differently? They behave a little differently because, and it's a it's a tremendous honor because you see these uh, very serious secrets of the United States. So the and you're above all things not supposed to coordinate with the executive because you exi if executive oversight were all that was needed. You wouldn't need the committee in the first place. The whole premise of the committee is Congress needs its own point of view as an institution, not as an adjunct of the majority of the moment. Congress as an institution. And Devin Nunes has just taken that in incredibly important tradition and trashed it. Uh, and he has acted like the PR man uh, for the White House. And, uh, and working, by the way, not even as, like as a, a really low grade <laughs> PR man. I mean, that. I, I mean, he was pretty much a backbencher before this. Yeah, but I mean, you look at this, this document that his group, uh, you know, that I, I keep saying that I think given the development of this country and the advances in wealth and knowledge that you would expect handcrafted artisanal collusion of justice. <laughs> and, and, and instead you're getting like this Twinkie collusion of justice. Like this is... Yeah. And, and the other Republicans on the committee have said what about this? Um, some of them have like, some of them have sort of look the other way, like Devin Nunes. Yeah, I think I met him once in a bus station. On the committee? Yeah, <laughs> but, yeah. yeah they, but they also voted to, to release this memo. Yes, but they're, they're not going out there. They're not, they're, you're not hearing from them that Devin Nunes is allowing himself to be made a, a face because I think many members recognize there are, there are risks. And um, what you also have to, what they have to wonder about is should the Republicans lose the House? Or the House, that there may be serious, you know, consequences for those members who, um, who took part in this. Uh, but we are now going to see something that we, ha what the Democrats on the committee now are going to feel obliged to do is to release their own answer. And so a committee whose premise was always that all of, all of its work was done behind closed doors, that they preserve solidarity, um, that, by the way, that they could be trusted. You know, uh, one of, and this is one of the, my themes of, the, of this book, one of the things with hypocrisy is even if we get through all of this um, in more or less okay form, there are real prices to be paid along the way that will not be so easy to repair. And this story about the memo is one of them. The committee, the intelligence committees of the House and Senate, the people who are set up to check the excesses of these agencies, rely to a huge extent on the voluntary cooperation of those agencies. Those agents have agencies have tremendous secrets, and if they want to hide from Congress, uh, they can probably do it. 
but there has been a tradition that they share because they are stronger and more politically legitimate when they have the approval of Congress as well as of the executive. So if you're an FBI director or an FBI agent, a CIA director and a CIA agent, and you see somebody like Devin Nunes taking your work, rifling through it for the crassest kind of political purposes, grossly misrepresenting it, and also maybe burning some of your operations. Burning you're, meaning giving them up? Yeah, giving them up. Um, and you know, we don't know, I mean, obviously Carter Page cannot be an important person in any investigation. Um, they, the FBI came across him in the course of investigating other things that seemed more serious. We don't know, I mean, there are people in the FBI who may or may be, um, say, you know, in the incidental things that Nunes is betraying as he pursues, are, are giving away important information in other investigations in which Carter Page was an incidental figure. That's why you're supposed to keep your mouth shut, because members of Congress are amateurs in these areas, and they do not always understand every aspect of every secret they see. So as you say in the book, this is, uh, Trump is a manifestation of the problems facing the party, the Republican Party, and the country, uh, but there have been many enablers yes. along the way, and pre-existing conditions, and we'll get to some of those in a second, but Mitch McConnell, uh, Paul Ryan, uh, the, you know, the leadership of the yeah. Republican Party. Why is it... They have been attacked by Donald Trump yes. from time to time on Twitter and elsewhere, as is Lindsey Graham and uh, pretty much everybody he ran against in the primary. So, are, and yet you, they seem to be falling in line fairly well and fairly quietly. And I'm wondering, is that because they're, what, afraid of becoming his target again? Because they're afraid of, you know, the base, Trump's base turning on them? I mean, what, what's going on there? All of, all of the above. Um, Paul Ryan is a person with a very aggressive agenda for the country. And it's, a, it's an agenda that happens to be not tremendously popular. So it's not something that you can just rely on people sending in their cards and letters from the country demanding the passage of his laws. He wants to do things that probably a majority of the country does not want. Like cutting entitlements. Like cutting entitlements, like this, this tax bill. Um, you know, the, the, um, even the parts of it that are sensible the, on the corporate side, um, obviously are not going to excite a lot of people with, uh, because the benefits are very long term. And meanwhile, on the, on the personal side, it's pretty crassly a redistribution from um, the uh, blue state affluent professionals um, to, red state, to red state constituencies and to the, um, the true plutocratic elite of the country. So you're not going to get, you're not going to be able to f compel a president to sign it whether he wants to or not. This is something that you need a president who isn't thinking that hard about his own re-election, because, or thinking that clearly about his own re-election, um, to sign. And so there's a pact. But I think what also, so um, what they have said is, you know, this man will sign our bills, we have to protect him, uh, because otherwise we won't pass our laws. But Mike Pence would do that too. Uh, Mike Pence will do that too, but Mike Pence isn't there. But there's an, along the way, something, and that's not an option, the only way you get to Mike Pence is by actually doing something pretty radical, which is um, once Donald Trump has won the nomination or won the presidency, going up against him. And then you bump into that Donald Trump understood the Republican base better than Paul Ryan and Mitch McConnell, and something else. And this is, you know, there are a lot of books out about Trump at the same time, and you know, they all should be read, and there's something to be learned from all of them. Um, and I, of course, was fascinated by the Michael Wolff book, read it attentively, but he gets, he gets one important thing wrong not just as an error of fact, but as a real error of judgment, and it's dangerous. And that is the presentation of Donald Trump as an imbecilic dotard. Um, that's a big mistake and a really ominous mistake. In fact, the, I mean, yes, for all the parts of the job that the president is supposed to do, Trump is very disengaged. But for the things the president is not supposed to do, uh, he's very wily and energetic, and he has the most ferocious will to power of any president certainly in my adult lifetime. And so people go up against him thinking because they know more or understand bureaucracy better that they will win and they discover there is, he's just got a desire for dominance that imposes itself on weaker spirits. Yeah, I was talking last week to uh, Jackie Spear, Bay Area Congresswoman, a Democrat who was on the House Intelligence Committee and you know we were talking about the Robert Mueller investigation and uh, she said that she thinks that what Trump is really concerned most about is that Mueller is going to dig in or will 
dig in too far into his real estate holdings yes. and the connections with Russian oligarchs who have purchased property and uh, condos and other things. Um, what do you what do you make of the investigation? And and I realize that's not really the basis of your book, and, but yeah. I, I'm just wondering, like, because it's all tied together in some ways. What what um, what is he really worried about? And what should he be worried about? Well, and, what, and therefore, what should we be worried about? I have a chapter on his past financial dealings, um, and. Uh, there, and, and since the book was finished, there have been s some more details on some of the sections, but they're, they're startling. Um, that the, the flows of money uh, from Russian individuals through numbered companies into his condo business. Um, uh, normally, Americans do not typically buy real estate through shell companies, and they especially do not buy Florida real estate through shell, shell companies because Florida has the Homestead Act. So if you, go, if you own a property in your own name in Florida, you can, even if you go bankrupt, that property cannot be attached so long as it's personally owned. So, you know, if you, if, if you, people tend to buy big houses in Florida as financial assets, knowing that they are protected, you know, against bankruptcy proceedings. You buy it through a shell company and you lose that advantage. So, why would, so when you see that Donald Trump is selling now something like a third of all of the properties in Florida to numbered companies, that makes you wonder. Uh, and USA Today has some, done some very good work on, on tracking this down. But the, the financial implications go beyond just Russia. Right now, Donald, there, there are Trump Towers in Manila. There are Trump Towers in Istanbul. Uh, there's a Trump Tower rising in Buenos Aires. There are four Trump Towers in uh, India and other, in Dubai. In all of these places, Donald Trump is not the developer. He has licensed his name to a local partner who pays him a fee. We don't know whether that's a dollar fee or a percentage fee. We don't know whether there are incentive bonuses in it. We don't know how much it is, whether we're talking about hundreds of thousands of dollars or millions or tens of millions. We, we don't know um, what percentage of Donald Trump's income uh, these flows represent. Is it a small part, a medium part, a big part, a dominant part? Uh, and, but what we do know is that the governments in those countries have tremendous pressure, power, over Donald Trump's business partners who in turn have some sway with him. Uh, his business partner in the Philippines was appointed by the Filipino government as a special en envoy to Washington to make sure that Filipino interests were well attended to by the President of the United States, and I bet they are. Well, and, and, and all the time he spends down uh, in Mar-a-Lago, I mean, right. that enhances the value, of course, which is not illegal, but uh, all these things, uh, to, uh, to, are they... Mar-a-Lago does not take you into Mueller territory, whereas these other things do, because they, 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 there are just, there are just, there's an, an ocean of potential problems. Conflicts. And Trump has always, through his business career, through its ups and downs, um, Trump has always been very concerned to keep law enforcement under his, to make special deals with local politicians, local law enforcement. He has never understood or accepted that law should be independent of him. He has always insisted on controlling it, and that's yes. the attitude he's going to take with Mueller. Yeah. One of the things you write in the book uh, is, and a quote here, there is no hypocrisy about Donald Trump. <laughs> Point is uh, that, you know, uh, He's basically doing what he said he was going to do. Yes. And I want to just ask you about that a little bit because, you know, a lot of what he said during the campaign was, I'm for the little guy. The little guy has been screwed by the swamp in Washington. I'm going to drain the swamp. Uh, I'm going to, you know, put this kind of the trade policy back on track to help blue collar workers. But at the same time, the tax policy is clearly tilted toward the wealthy. Uh, he's undoing Obama-era protections on things like student loans and payday lending. Uh, he's sort of destabilizing the healthcare markets. So is, that, is none of that hypocrisy? No, I would say none of that is hypocrisy. I, 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 lies or what? I would say, look, if, if, you're, if you're relying on guarantees or assurances from Donald Trump, you know, join the queue of disillusioned people, including the ex-wives, the former business partners, the credit. Obviously, no, any guarantee or promise from Donald Trump is worthless. Um, but what I meant when I said there's no hypocrisy, I think that section of the book I, I was recalling a question that was put to Hillary Clinton in uh, one of the debates where she was asked if she could say something positive about Donald Trump. And, and, and they'd obviously wargamed this as the Hillary campaign wargamed everything, maybe even a little bit to death. And she, so she said, um, he's raised good kids. So I don't think that's a view that very many people would take today. <laughs> uh, but so I, my answer, I said, but I can come up with and so what I won, and that is the hypocrisy, because what I meant to say there is, and, and this is especially for our evangelical friends and neighbors, you're on notice. Donald Trump never pretended to be a good father. 
He never pretended to be a good husband. He never pretended to be a kind man. He never pretended to be a man uh, until the very end, a man of faith. He never pretended to be a charitable person. Um, and he never pretended to be a decent, kind human being. He's made it clear he despises that. He, he, he could not have been more, I mean, he would literally end his rallies by quoting a parable whose punchline was, you knew I was a snake when you took me in. Yeah. So you have no excuse for being fooled. Well, and you say, you can't say you weren't forewarned. Yeah. And I'm wondering, I mean, certainly elites, people who read the New York Times, people who read the Atlantic, people who read the Huffington Post, uh, you know, you could say they were forewarned, but were, you know, the average working class folks, the blue collar people in Wisconsin and Michigan and Pennsylvania, were they really forewarned? Look, and who, like, from who? Fox News didn't warn them. No, we, because this is just our human sense. Um, to understand whether Donald Trump was a successful or unsuccessful businessman in his previous career, I mean, you, how can anybody figure that out for themselves. I mean, you have to rely on information and fairly detailed information. I understand there are a lot of people, I, I, I can well understand why many people had the impression he was good at business when he wasn't. Um, I could well understand why many people didn't understand that he had a record of breaking his promises. But we are, as animals, just equipped with a knowledge of who is cruel and who is kind. Uh, that is something we all, we have evolved to see. Um, I, a story I don't tell in the book, um, I, I, I forgot, it just it seemed too trivial, but it's, it's actually one that sort of sticks with me, is D Donald Trump has a youngest son, um, who I think is now 11, uh, who, with whom, from whom he's very distant, but, um, to whom he promised that if he were elected president and they left New York and came to Washington, D.C., he would buy the boy a dog, which the boy desperately wants. And there was a story in the Washington Post with a friend of Donald Trump's, a wealthy woman, who had a dog that the boy really, really, really wanted, and the boy met the woman, and the woman offered the boy the dog, and Donald Trump promised in, in front of this witness that, he would, if, that when they got to Washington, he would buy the son a dog. And he broke that promise. Hmm. Now, that's not... To be cruel, or what, like what? That, the point is, that's not on the top 500 of Donald Trump's moral offenses. But, <laughs> but it's something we all know, we all can tell which father... Well, if he makes his son a promise to get a dog, we'll do it. And who are the fathers who won't? We, that we know. Barack Obama kept his promise, as Bar I recall. Yeah, that, Barack that Obama, particular promise. not a dog lover, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> um, you uh, say that you, you held your nose and voted for Hillary Clinton in the last presidential yeah. election. So um, I'm wondering, I, I, don't, I guess you live in D.C. Yes. You live in D.C.? I live in D.C. So you have a... You have a if you have a you have Hel, El, uh, Eleanor Holmes Norton, Norton, so you have a Democrat representing you, but yeah. you know, are you? Would you hold? Would you hold your nose again, or will you in in the fall and and vote for Democrats? I mean, would you, given what you write about in the yeah. book, do you want Democrats to take control of the House and or the Senate? So, so let me. I, I mean, I, I don't know how interesting my behaviors are to anybody, but, um, <laughs> but. Uh, no, I mean this here because... Well, I, I think I, it just goes to how deep but, is the conviction, I think. Okay, but um, so here's what... If, if I were a resident of the state of California, I mean, I'm not an expert on California politics, but I imagine I would be voting uh, for Republican candidates for the state assembly and state senate and governor. Um, I mean, generally, that's my philosophy about how government should work. Um, I, I mean, the Hillary Clinton vote was um, I mean, a difficult one because I, um, a lot of the ethical concerns about Donald Trump, I mean, they're not as extreme in the Hillary Clinton case that they were there. And I, when I said I hold my note, I mean, literally what happened was I, I was away from D.C. on voting day, so I got an, uh, an absentee ballot. And look, D.C., I mean, how much your vote in D.C., which was, what, 92% Democratic, it's, it's not so important, but I always take part. And I filled out the form, and it sat in the outbox of my mailed it for about five days before I put it, because that was, the, the, it wasn't literally, it was actually sort of like the, um, uh, but I, if you're the, the immediate way to check, the best immediate way to check is to get some gavels into Democratic hands. Yes, I understand that. Um, and that's really important. So are, but you, are, you, are you pulling for the Democrats to win either or both? I, 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 well, obviously, it would be, this country would be in much safer if Adam Schiff were chair of the House Intelligence Committee. <laughs> then, uh, But it, it, it comes at a cost because a lot of, and this is one of the, the themes of this, a lot of things, 
I mean, I, a lot of th- I, in order to do that, a lot of things are going to happen if that should that I don't like. And I think one of the challenges and tests of these Trump years is um, we have to learn to separate our our political and our constitutional commitments. And so, since this seems to be a predominantly Democratic crowd, <laughs> let me give you let me give you a hard teaching here um, for you, because one of the things I hear a lot about members of Congress like John McCain or Jeff Flake is they will raise their voices against some Trump views. And then somebody said, well, that's no good because you voted for the corporate income tax cut. I said, well, of course they did. They're Republicans. Of course they voted for the corporate income tax cut. And the way I would think about this is imagine this. One of the big arguments of the book is that these anti-democratic tendencies are true across the developed world. And they come from deep places and not from only from specifically American sources, but from things that are... And I, 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 we can talk about that, but just take my word for it for now. This is a global or a developed world phenomenon. And in many countries, Trumpism has shown up not in the former party of the right, but in the former party of the left. In Italy, uh, it's Trump, the Trumpist candidate is on the left. In England, Jeremy Corbyn. Um, in, in, in some of the small countries of South, South Eastern Europe, like in former communist parties, you've seen these. Now, imagine it, um, in the United States, I think that would have been less likely to happen, but... I can create a scenario uh, of where it did. Now imagine that, that some Jeremy Corbyn figure had, had somehow bounced his way into the presidency and was surrounded by people who were literal Stalinists and was a literal apologist for Hamas and Hezbollah. And there were Democratic members of the House and Senate who stood up to that person and um, stood up for the FBI and the CIA and stood up against Hamas and Hezbollah and, and said you shouldn't have literal Stalinists advising you. Would it be fair for people like me to then say, but you don't agree with me on school choice? You know, unless you agree with me on school choice, I'm not interested in what you have to say about Jeremy Corbyn. And that, that's the way I feel when I hear people criticizing Jeff Flake. Jeff Flake is a very economically conservative person. And that's why, he's a, it's a, this, that's why it's all the more impressive that he has done what he has done. But coming back to my question, uh, you said the country would be better off with Adam Schiff uh, as chair, but that can only happen, of course, uh, if the House is yeah. taken back by the House. Is it, would the country be better off with Democrats in charge of either the House and or the Senate. Uh, yeah, I, I think the country will be better off with Democrats in control of one house than two, uh, because t- two begins to get expensive. Um, <laughs> to who? Uh, to taxpayers, businesses, people in productive enterprise. I mean, there are... If you're in th- California, and that tax bill is going to cost you a lot of money. <laughs> well, that, uh, that, was, no, that, that, is, that was squalid. I mean, the individual part of it is squalid. And... Um, and there's a certain degradation of traditional Republican belief. They stuffed a lot of just, you know, red state revenge into that bill. Um, that said, that said, in the context of true tax reform, I think there's a. Uh, I don't think that those deductions are coming back because, in the context of true tax reform, um, they are. Uh, they they don't make a, the housing. De- the mortgage interest deduction and the state and local deduction in genuinely do not make a lot of sense, and that's why people have, you know, thought about them. Uh, the the problem is when you when you put all the cost of reform on your opponent's states and none of the cost of reform on your own states, and in fact use the proceeds of, of reform. So I, I, think, you know, the, um, I think one of the obvious things you would say is, well, the economies of the red states are much more carbon intense than those of the blue states. So you would balance the takeaway of the state and or the curtailing the state and local deduction with a carbon tax to say, okay, the red states also have to pay um, the cost of, of running the government. And the United States is down its way to trillion dollar or nearly trillion dollar deficits in peacetime, in prosperity. I mean, George W. Bush, I think, ran $700 billion deficits as he was fighting two wars. Barack Obama ran $800 billion deficits in the throes of the worst downturn since the Great Depression. Um, there's, no ex- there's no excuse for this. And uh, we are going to have to rectify the finances of the United States. Everybody's going to have to kick in, and that's going to mean that um, the red states can't ride for free. So when you think about, I mean, this book is obviously aimed at Trump and Trumpism. Um, but in many ways, you, it's hard. I mean, the, the Republican Party is now the, the party of Trump in many ways. Um, and, and so I'm just wondering, setting aside the lies, the tweets, yeah. you know, the uh, attacks on law enforcement and the FBI and the CIA, setting that aside, uh, <laughs> Trump's done a lot of things, and, and, and you know, the, not all passing legislation, but a lot of things. So of the things he's done uh, and the, with Congress, w- which ones do you support? Um, I think it makes sense to move the embassy to Jerusalem. 
Um, I think this is a good year to do it because this is a time when historically the United States has hesitated to do that uh, because of its concerns above all for the relationships with Sunni Arab states in the Gulf and their this is a moment of real friendship between Israel and, this, and all but undeclared alliance. I think that, that's a good thing. As I, say, I, I think the corporate side of the uh, tax reform has a lot of merit to it. Um, it it's very imperfect. You would want to see brace, base broadening and, you'd want to, uh, and this pass-through uh, arrangement is, is just a, an outrage. It's just a giveaway. Um, uh, and I think that there are selective elements of the deregulatory things they've done that are... But, it's, this is a kind of a, a wrong path because my, my book is about constitutional and not political commitments. And I would say I mean, there are a lot of things I would like to see done, but there are things, there are things I would not do to get those things done. I mean, I, I'm supposing there were a tax bill that I 100% approved of. I loved every detail. I still would not be in favor of kidnapping the children of the minority leader of the U.S. Senate and holding them to ransom until he agreed to go along with the measure. I mean, there are things you just don't do in, in a democratic state. And I think with a, a, lot of the, a lot of the, even the good parts, I minded, and many people will know this joke in this room, of the story of the Plotkin diamond. Is a familiar joke? Okay, the, uh, uh, in the days when women sat under the hairdryer, two women are sitting under the hairdryer, and one notices on the ring, foot finger of the other an amazingly beautiful diamond ring. And, and she, it's so startling, startling, she just, she can't help herself. She has to, what is that ring you were wearing. And the, woman, the wearer of the ring says, it is indeed a, a beautiful ring. In fact, it's a very famous stone. It's a legendary stone. It's been, uh, it's been worn by uh, count, uh, members of the aristocracy, nieces of popes, queens in Europe, and um, this storied ring even has a name. It's, this is, this is a, the Plotkin diamond. The Plotkin diamond, how amazing. And I was, yeah, yeah, it's, and it's got a long history, but like many legendary stones, the Plotkin diamond comes with a terrible curse. A curse, how romantic, what is the curse? The curse of the Plotkin diamond is Mr. Plotkin. <laughs> so, um, not sure where to go with that. Uh, coming back to this idea of, uh, uh, I know in some ways, I guess the point of my earlier question was that attacking Trump is sort of the low hanging fruit. You know, it's easy. Uh, because of the outrageous things he does yeah. on a practically hourly basis. And what's a little harder than that is to untangle Trump, Trumpism, from the Republican policies. And, and so I'm just trying to figure out... I think out. you have to widen the aperture much more than that. And let me give you the, the single most alarming... The, the book is full of studies and data points. The single most alarming data point in the whole book is this. Um, a German political scientist named Yasha Monk, who's now at Harvard and will have a, an excellent book of his own coming out in April, uh, got a big grant to do research across a, more than a dozen developed countries. Um, and he asked this question, is it essential to live in a democratic state? Among those people born in the 1930s, about 90% said it is essential. He then followed, went asked by decades of age, and with each day, decade of age, the number who said it was essential declined until you reach people who were born after 1980, and across the developed world, about 25% of people born after 90s said it was essential. And just to make sure that, he, that they weren't mishearing the question or interpreting, he, he followed up with questions like, well, would, would you consider, would it be better to have military rule? And obviously it was a small minority, but a significant minority of people under 30 said yes, they'd prefer military rule. And if you ask the question, what about having a strong man who can cut through, then you began to get quite considerable numbers. And this is true in the United States, in Germany, in Canada, in Sweden. Um, and it's, the, the figures are actually higher in places like Canada and Sweden than they are even in the United States. So we have, I think with, with all, when we think about Donald Trump, one of the things I argue against much of the analysis is when you have a problem that is bigger than America, you can't have an America-specific explanation. We are living through a global crisis of democracy. We are seeing the rise of Trump-like parties across the world uh, and Trump-like figures. The United the United States, we would have thought, was more resistant. And it's true, there was a little bit of a lucky bounce that brought a Trump-like figure t to power here. But a Trump-like party has the second most seats in the Parliament of the Netherlands. Um, the National Front in France doubled its vote share between 2002 and 2017. You have a far-right party in the uh, German Bundestag for the first time since the last time a far-right party had power in the German Bundestag. Um, that's not good. Uh, and 
we have a, we have a, we have, we have actual parties like this actually in power in Poland, Hungary, and other places. So you're saying even if Trump hadn't gotten elected, that this phenomenon would be happening across the world. We we need to understand that something something is going wrong in democratic life, and sometimes it shows itself in different countries in the party of the right, and sometimes in the party of the left. Let me say one more thing about party competition, because mercifully we are. Americans are living longer and longer, at least those who are educated and affluent are living longer, and staying active longer and longer. But the price of that is we have import, important parts of our citizenry are carrying around political ideas from 20 and 30 years before and applying it to a country that has changed. Uh, for much of the post-war period, every democracy had a party of the right and the party of the left, and some, or, multi, but they would have, or one big one. And the party of the right was the party of... Um, and the party of the left was the party of people who worked for wages, people who had more debts than assets, uh, people who worked in the public sector. The party of the right was the party of the opposite, people uh, who worked for salaries or dividends, people who um, had more assets than debts, people who worked in the private sector. True, German Christian Democrats, British conservatives, Australian liberals, Canadian progressive conservatives, American Republicans, it was the same map. Today, we see around the world that that is no longer how you predict how people vote. Um, there, that what predicts how people voted is whether your grand, the voters' grandparents belonged to the local ethnic majority or whether they belonged not to the local ethnic majority. Mm -hmm. And beyond that, then they, they can have any, they can have almost any. I mean, you have, Democrat, you have Democrats now in the United States who have views that are indistinguishable from the economic views of a Reagan-era Republican, um, but uh, they, have different, they have the wrong grandparents. Yeah. Do, do you, you think, would Ronald Reagan recognize this Republican Party? Um, it, he would recognize it has a family. What you do is you take certain aspects of his party and you exaggerate them, and you take other aspects of his party and eliminate them. And yes, there's a family resemblance in the way that, you know, um, a particularly disappointing great grandchild has a family resemblance. But but the but you know, as you said earlier, having a president, or maybe I heard you earlier on the radio. Forgive me if that's what it was. The notion that we have a president who may be in collusion yeah. in some way with Russia, that what there was no part of the Republican Party that believed that or would have accepted that when Ronald Reagan was around. Well, there was no there was no part of any party. I mean, that uh, I one reason I date the beginning of the, the the decline in our institutions. I date it very intensely from the beginning of this century and the ill feeling over the Bush v. Gore Supreme Court decision. But I think this, I would really start the story at the end of the Cold War because the discipline of the Cold War bound the, there are just things so long as the country faced a truly existential foreign threat, there are things you didn't do. I mean, in 1988, if any politician were found to have had corrupt dealings with the Soviet Union, um, it would have been, I just, it would have been, I mean, it's unthinkable, it would have been explosive. Uh, it would have been an explosive thing. Um, the country no longer feels it has that kind of existential threat from a major geopolitical round. It's very afraid of the external world. Uh, more afraid maybe than ever, but not, there's not some singular competitor that Americans are afraid of as a military threat. They fear China as an economic rival. Um, they fear Russia's ability to make mischief. They fear uh, terrorism from uh, or originating in parts of the Islamic world. Tampering with our democracy? But, but the inhibition against working with a foreign power, that has obviously changed. And I mean, I still find it obviously very shocking, and it's the single most shocking thing about the whole election. Uh, but that, that is one of the things, that, that, that is one of the um, norms that is weakened. One, one final point, I make this, I, this is a point I make in the book, that the founders of the country at the Constitutional Convention were very worried about foreign sway over the president. Um, it was debated uh, at the con in Madison's notes that impeachment comes up twice with reference to the case of Charles II, who was king of England a hundred years before the American Revolution, and who took bribes from Louis XIV of France, and who altered American, or, sorry, English foreign policy in order to keep the bribes. And they had his example in mind because they were creating a country that was smaller, weaker, and poorer than the other great powers that were present in this hemisphere, Spain, France, and England. Yeah. Let's take some audience questions yes. here. Um, in order to get back on track to restore democratic norms and checks, what is the most important conversation step needed to be taken in the 2018 election? Um, uh, I think we need to get, I would say there are two things. We need to get absolutely to the bottom of the foreign influence in the 2016 election. 
we need to have some agreed plans for how to prevent that from happening in 2020. It will happen in 2018. No one's on guard, and why wouldn't the Russians do it again? Um, and we need, I say this with some sadness, but some things that had always been understandings have to be formalized. And we're going to need a law requiring the president to release his tax returns, the vice president. Actually, it should be the major party. The moment you accept Secret Service protection. <coughs> Uh, you should have to release your tax returns. That seems, that seems a fair trade. You, you, you know, taxpayers paying to your safety. What would you, uh, where, would, where would you place the odds of a Republican Congress passing that? Um, I, I think it will pass sometime in the, the next one or two administrations. And I think by that point, I think the Republican Party is going to be a very different, I think it's going to go through a lot of pain. Um, and a lot of disgrace. And I think what's going to come up, I think we're gonna have a very different party system in general. Let me, actually, let me th here's a way to think about this. It was in a room of, of people of some historical memory. Um, if, imagine someone standing on a timeline with 1990 as the center year. And they move 25 years to the right to 2015. And they wake up under the Rip Van Winkle doze and they say, who's running for president? And they're told Bush and Clinton. And what are they talking about? Iraq and health care. Um, what are people worried about? The deficit. Nothing's changed. Um, the country's changed. I mean, the, there's no internet in 1990, China is a poor country in 1990, but the political system has been frozen. Now you do the same thing going backwards 25 years from 1990. You're in 1965. The cities are on fire. The most powerful man in Washington is the head of the AFL-CIO. They're you know, Southern segregationist Democrats. They're, conservative, they're liberal Republicans. It's a different world. I think what happened between 65 and 90 in a dynamic country like this is normal. And what happened between 1990 and 2015 in this country is aberrant. And I think the, the politics... I think if you go 10 years from 2015, it's going to look, it's going to be a very different kind of landscape. And the parties are going to look much more different from their previous selves than they've looked over the past quarter century. Better or worse? Different. Um, uh, they're going to attract different kinds of constituencies and different in ways that are hard to predict. I mean, if the Democratic Party continues to move as far to the economic left as it's moved in the past years, I mean, you may see this idea that Repu that Remember I said there were a lot of economic conservatives whose grandparents did, were not part of the local ethnic majority who were in the Democratic Party for that reason. It may be that they leave anyway, and they put up with the thing, the, you know, bad manners from the Republicans because at least the Republicans will, you know, are not going to impose a wealth tax on them. Yeah. Um, that you can, I don't know, I, I, and a lot of it depends on how we handle this. One last thing about that, I'm, I'm, I'm very much not in the prediction business and not just because I predicted that Hillary Clinton would win the election. <laughs> Because making predictions requires you to think like, it requires you to believe that the future is fixed. And this is a moment when the future is more plastic and depends more on good or bad decisions that individuals make than at any point I can remember. So don't make predictions, make the future. Yeah. Um, you mentioned the carbon tax uh, earlier when we were talking about the tax bill. And of course, President uh, Obama signed the Paris Accords. Oh, uh, uh, Trump has crit been critical of those, wants to pull out of those. Uh, may have already pulled out of those. Uh, maybe yes. he's just, yeah. Uh, he's also undoing a lot of the regulations. Uh, he's, I think the tax bill removes tax credits for green energy, uh, all kinds of things uh, that in many people who believe in data and science would say are taking the country in the wrong direction. Why, what's your speculation about why, assuming, I mean, there's a lot of climate change deniers and there's some who just vote for various things for some reason or another, their donors want them to. Uh, I don't know where, what your position is on climate change, but you could argue that that is an existential threat, not just to the United States, yeah. but to the world. And so what, you know, these private conversations that Republicans have over martinis or whatever, uh, yeah. what, how do they, what do they think about that future? Well, well let's, they, let's remember that the international climate negotiation process began under President George H.W. Mm -hmm. Bush. Um, the first important round of conversations uh, that took place on the subject occurred in, during the Bush administration. The first world leader to speak seriously about this issue was Margaret Thatcher back in the 19, middle 1980s. Um, so the climate change issue is an example of how issue, of one of the ways that the American political system goes wrong, which is you take issues that are outside the historic thing that parties are arguing about and that they become seized as shibboleths by one party or another, and they become party touchstones. And, uh, and, the, and, and then they become a way of organizing the party system even though they don't have to be. And there's often a lot of randomness about that. There's often a lot of corruption, that somebody 
who has an interest in this issue um, will pay a certain number of decisive actors, not members of Congress, but people just outside. And they then inscribe this element into party dogma. And there are, there are democratic versions of this as well. Um, and so the problem is not just that, the, um, that we tend to um, ignore facts. Democrats have their own versions of that. Uh, but that we live in a system of what a political scientist has aptly called a system of weak parties, but strong partisanship. So that people let their party feelings dictate their beliefs about a lot of issues that are, have nothing to do with party politics. Mm. But, but again, I mean, th there are consequences for those things, you know? I mean, we're here now in California, the, the wildfire season is pretty much year round. Yeah. Uh, floods, wildfires, uh, you know, there's all kinds of weird weather going on. A, so there are consequences, I mean, so I'm- real I'm, consequences. I, so, I mean, aside from, it goes beyond partisanship, right? I mean, it affects people's lives. Yeah, no, look, it's a subject I worry about a lot. Um, and. I worry especially uh, afterwards, uh, there are a couple of, there are two books, one on the 17th century, one on the end of the Roman Empire that, that deal with these climate issues that both make their own this point. That the most important and most alarming question about climate change is not is it man-made, but does it happen fast or slow? And one of the, one of the, most of the climate models assume that what happens is you have a gradual path. Um, and what has actually happened in past periods when the world's climate, now in both of these cases for natural reasons, um, in the 1590s the world got suddenly dramatically colder, and so it did in the 540s. And in both those, you had huge civilizational consequences just because the, the change happened faster than the societies of the time could cope. I and mean, we have more resilience, because we're more technologically advanced, we also have a lot more people um, on this planet, and many of them in very marginal situations. Um, so. Yes, this is the press, and to have a president who doesn't think seriously about things is a problem. It's a problem for our foreign policy. But it's not just the president. I mean, you know, the whole war on coal. We've been hearing about that for eight years, ten years, well, the, the war, sixteen years. Uh, the war on coal is very driven by regional politics. It's worth keeping in mind that the entire coal industry, not the miners, but ev the bookkeepers, everybody, the, the total employment of the coal industry is less than the total number of registered yoga instructors in the United States. <laughs> Um, uh, but they're very important in the upper Midwest. Um, and so it's kind of like an ethanol in, in reverse. My favorite phrase from the President's State of the Union speech was clean, beautiful coal. But, but also, the, the thing to remember there, and this is one of the things, is that's Donald Trump. Trump I mean, he just also has this habit of if I know that large numbers of people that I don't like care about something, I'm just going to go break it. And not because I cared about that thing myself 10 minutes ago. I just like to break things that people care about. I like to hurt people. And you know, that, uh, you'll, re you'll remember that exchange he had with Andrew McCabe, where he said, at the end, oh, by the way, how does it feel that your wife is such a political loser? He j that, that, that's just that desire to give pain gratuitously is such an important part of his personality. Don't you think he'll get his? <laughs> I, do, I, I don't, I, I'm not so worried about, I, I, I have bigger fish to fry, I, I don't know. Also, I think one of the, the things um, about bad people is they're also always pathetic people. And um, when they, when and if, and I'm not making any comment about the president, but when and if in general, when bad people get their comeuppance, it's always sad to see. Um, and that's one of the reasons it's important just to keep them away from power. Because what, you're, you, you, what you don't want to do is have like, you know, if we all got our desserts, who among us would escape whipping, uh, Shakespeare. Um, you know, we're all very flawed. What you want to do is make sure that the people in power are, the, are conscientious people with a view to history, and they're bounded by systems because even the best people will abuse power. All right, let's take some more questions from the audience. Yeah, you folks have a lot of questions, by the way, that's good. Uh, what role do you think Fox and the far-right media and far-right evangelicals play in conditioning the GOP base to Trumpocracy? Uh, media systems have been tremendously important. I talk a lot about that. Uh, Donald Trump began, his, or, uh, along the way, Donald Trump broke Fox. They began by treating him as kind of a joker. They played him for ratings, but at the first debate, you'll remember, they sent up their three most professional journalists, 
uh, Chris Wallace, uh, Megyn Kelly, and Brett Baer to ask Donald Trump very tough questions. You read the transcripts. Those are tough, tough, embarrassing questions. And he went wild with rage, concentrated his rage on the woman, as he is uh, characteristic to do, although Wallace's and Bayer's questions were just as searching as uh, Megyn Kelly's. And Fox discovered what the Republican Party discovered, which is that their base liked Donald Trump better than it liked their talent. And he brought them to heel. I mean, that, and that's, as I said, when you do not underestimate his will to power, don't let Michael Wolff mislead you about that. All right, here's another question. Uh, bu- 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 I'm going to skip the first part of that question. Uh, <laughs> has anything changed or evolved with regards to your conservatism, more compassion, any more liberal thoughts, she said, hopefully, in parentheses? Uh, I, I, I don't think you should assume. You know, there, there's a lot of research on how uh, conservatives, this is pre-Trump, give more money to charity uh, than liberals do. I don't think you should assume that... They also have more money. No, no, they're more reli- they're more religious. They're more religious. Um, that's the di- liberals, liberals are more educated. No, the, it's it's religious affiliation that makes the difference. Um, so I, I I just don't think that one should pat oneself on the back so hard. Um, so yeah, I mean I, I have I've changed my mind about a lot of issues over my lifetime, and I've tried for those who are interested to give accountings for it when I have, and I've written about it um, on, on my website if you care. Uh, there's a button called Second Thoughts where you can read, about, there, we've got about a dozen issue, collected essays where I've written about things I've changed my mind about. Um, but what I think is more to the, the thing that I am more conscious of is that the world changes. I mean, you'd better change your views about things because they, they keep changing the exam questions. And if you give the same answers, uh, you're going to be worse, you're just going to be irrelevant. You're not going to be able to be of any use to anybody. All right, another question. What advice can you offer for never-Trump Republicans who are swimming against the tide of their party and who want the GOP to return to conservative first principles? Uh, keep the faith. Uh, your, your, your party needs you. Um, and first, remember why you are a conservative and a Republican. And, and second, remember this, that it's no good at all for a, a political system to have one party that accepts democratic norms and one that isn't so sure. Uh, you need to. And people who are committed to democratic norms are, should go where they are most needed, and where they are most needed is inside the Republican yeah. Party. You think uh, I get emails from John Kasich, not personal emails, but you know, his organization, uh, several times a week. Uh, he's letting me know what he's up to. Thanks. Yes. Appreciate that, Governor. Uh, what, uh, what is he up to? And do you think there's a chance that a Republican such as John Kasich will challenge uh, Donald Trump if he's he, in fact running for real? He's election? obviously contemplating a primary challenge. Um, I don't think two-term governors of states launch themselves into quixotic adventures. So I think he's also taking the temperature on whether it would go somewhere. Um, I think Mitt Romney, who looks like he will run for an, what may be an open Senate seat, is getting ready to be in, I think we will see some of these, voice, these voices. Jeff Flake. Uh, Jeff Flake and whatever he does. Now, he may be a 2020 primary challenger. I think you, people will be heard from. At this point, they're all exploring. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, all right. Let's see. Crisis time for our democracy. Are you? Do you see a role for all living ex-presidents to speak out as a bipartisan body? We've seen. We saw that extraordinary yeah. day uh, a few months ago with both uh, W and Obama speaking on yeah. the same day. I'm sure that wasn't a coincidence. That is not a coincidence. So uh, Jimmy Carter and George H. W. Bush are. I mean, Jimmy Carter is in great health. George W. H. W. Bush is in bad health, um, but they're they're both obviously, you know, in the in the late, later phases of life. For the three presidents who may be with us for a while, um, I'm gonna put in a little commercial for my old boss. It's an interesting thing that the, that the Bush Clinton relationship is extremely cordial. Um, sorry, that is actually is, is truly friendly. They're they're two friends, and the uh, Bush Obama relationship is extremely cordial. With W or? With W. I'm sorry, I'm talking about the three younger presidents. Yeah. Um, the Clinton-Obama relationship is more complicated. <laughs> uh, and so... Who's the, that on? Uh, <laughs> Never mind. All complicated... Right? I, 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 one, of the theme, one of the themes I think that's... I'm not, a bi- I'm, not a, I'm not hugely interested in questions like whose fault is it or who's right. Uh, because especially... I mean, it's on both. It's on, um, that you just, it's just a fact that you have to integrate into your, into your thinking. So 
George, sure, George W.'s Bush, Bush's role here is especially crucial because he is the he is the pivot, the intermediary, the person who can actually say to Clinton and Obama, "This is a time when three mm. need to speak out." I don't think either of those two could ever yeah. have that kind of impact. So the the W. The w Bush, you know, it's not possible. It, it, you know, he may not have played the last act in his political career. Yeah, it, it is interesting uh, how former presidents, I mean, they are members of a very small club and they do seem to bond in some ways. And it seems like that's yet another norm that Donald Trump is blowing up. They also, they also receive a redacted version of the president's daily intelligence brief. And so while they don't see quite what the president sees, uh, that ex-presidents know a lot about the dangers the country faces and they retain deep relationships and I believe they all own phones. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned, uh, of course, your old boss, uh, George W. Bush. Uh, and it is interesting to hear so many Democrats thinking about him nostalgically. Uh, well, not to mention Reagan and Nixon. Yeah. Uh, but um, you, you, as we said at the very beginning, helped coin the phrase axis of evil. It was it Iran, North Korea, and Iraq, I think, were the three. Uh, that became part of the pretext for the war in Iraq. Um, do you have any regrets about that? Um, I, I've written about this a lot, um, and it's a, I have complicated feelings about it because obviously the war was not a success. Um, was it a mistake, though? Could it have been a mistake? Could it, could it have been a, a success? Uh, could it have been a success? Um, let me put it this way. Uh, once you discover, the, the, since the reason for the war was to stop Iraq from getting a nuclear weapon, um, it, it could not have been a success because you would not be able to fulfill the stated purpose of the war. Um, but I believe that was a good faith mistake, certainly on the part of President George W. Bush. Uh, he sincerely believed it. I certainly believed it. Um, everyone I knew sincerely believed it. Um, could it have been a success in, in that could we, if we'd sent, if George W. Bush had said, okay, we're going to send half a million men from the very start, we're going to make the kind of investment in Iraq, um, then Iraq might have had more of a chance, but the United States would never have done that. That if, the, if confronted with the true project, um, I don't think the country would have agreed to do it. So um, it, it began on a term where it, there was a threat, uh, and then there was a false idea about how easy this would be, and so it careened into, into failure. On the other hand, I have to look back and say, well, and this is a subject that obsesses me in my political thinking, there's always the other door, and you don't know what's down that other door. Uh, down the other door is the United States does not invade Iraq. The price of oil goes up in 2005. Saddam Hussein, who was poor from 1995 to 2005, becomes very rich again. What does he do with that, all of those oil? Up to 1995, he's an incredibly, and the sanctions regime is crumbling. Uh, there were not going to be sanctions on Iraq for very much longer. The, the important sanctions were gone. And the whole Arab Middle East is in the throes of this Malthusian crisis, um, you know, populations doubling, no work water running out, the climate changing in ways that are adverse to them. Like, as in Syria, we have the three worst harvests in Syrian history in the um, three of the five years before the Syrian civil war breaks out. Iraq's even drier than Syria. Um, what was, what's down the other door? We can never know. Yeah. Um, but I, I, don't, I don't know that we face, I don't know that we face some really attractive options there. One last thing about it. It wasn't like we were at peace with Iraq. We, were, we had been at war with Iraq nonstop since 1990. We had an armistice. Um, but the second biggest use of American air power since the end of the Cold War is Bill Clinton's air campaign in Iraq in 1998. Um, had Al Gore been elected, I don't think you would have seen American ground forces in Iraq, but you would have seen more rounds of aerial combat with Iraq. I mean, I don't, we don't talk about this much longer, but the, the, you know, Iraq was also the major check on Iran. I don't think that was going to, but Iraq, I think Iraq was heading on a path because, um, because it, the place, I think the place was going to blow up one way or the other. I don't know that it, it was only a check on Iran so long as the Saddam Hussein regime not only held together but deployed real military power. Yeah. All right, so let's see, we've got time for a little, maybe a couple more questions. Uh, in today's Atlantic, uh, there is a call to boycott the Republican Party. Yes. I, I haven't read the article, but what are your thoughts? I read the article, so the, uh, it's written by two people, Jonathan Rausch and Ben Wittes. Jonathan Rausch has been one of my closest friends since 1977, uh, 1978, and Ben Wittes is a very good friend. Um, I, uh, so I read attentively and with enormous respect everything they, they say. Uh, I think 
the article would have been benefited from the omission of some words. Um, because they, they wrote the article not just about federal politics, but also about state politics. And while there have been, I, I think that I write in the book, I'm very concerned about the Republican despair leading many state Republican parties uh, to um, engage in voter suppression. I think the United States also has, I mean, in its most dynamic, most advanced, most important, he said, sucking up to the hometown crowd state, uh, you would benefit from two-party politics in California. Uh, and, uh, but I, I have to say, who's, who, I know you don't like to say whose fault is it, but I mean, it, it it, been, it, you know, it, yes, I would agree with It doesn't matter whose fault it is, who, but, who but, loses? The Repub it's not the Republican Party that is the loser from the absence of two-party competition in California. It's the voter and taxpayer and citizen of California. Because what happens when you don't have two-party politics, of course, is you get factional politics. And factional politics are all, almost always less productive than two-party politics. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. Okay, I'll leave that there. I, I regret we, have, we had, didn't have more time to talk about immigration because yeah. that, that, that's a big part of all that. Um, let's see. Maybe I can slip in one or two more. Um, has the Republican Party lost its sense of patriotism? Um, I think the Republican Party is a lot of people in a lot of places. Um, I, I would say that obviously Donald Trump cares about nobody but himself, and that is true about his family, and they are willing to uh, pay a very, very high moral price for the presidency. Confronting that, um, they have put a lot of Republicans in a patriotic quandary. Some people have very eagerly jumped after Donald Trump. Some people have been dragged after him. Uh, I, I don't want to impugn any large group of people, um, but we, it, we need to reestablish the strong principle uh, that it is absolutely unacceptable to work with a hostile foreign intelligence agency. Without being, by the way, extremely, because it's obviously, I mean, it's obviously been true that America's friends have opinions about America's elections. I mean, they, they, that, um, the French and Germans, Gerhard, I should speak of the people, I mean, um, uh, Ger, uh, Schroeder and Chirac made no secret in 2004 that they could not wait to see the back of George W. Bush, Benjamin Netanyahu, uh, obviously preferred Mitt Romney over Obama in 2012. That's, that's inevitable. Um, and so long as this is done through non-clandestine means, it's a normal part. I mean, actually, you kind of want to know. I, I'm, I appreciate knowing which president is going to do, be more welcomed by America's friends. Yeah. I think that's, that's useful information for me as a voter. Uh, I, I, if they ca carry out a campaign of disinformation and of corruption in American soil, that's a different, different matter. But, yeah. uh, and that's what is, that is what is unique. But I don't want to suggest that you know, it's inherently wrong for foreign governments, especially our friends, uh, to, ex to make clear that they have views. Of course they have views. Well, we've reached uh, that point in our program. We have one last question. I want to give you an opportunity to leave it on a hopeful note. And in yeah. fact, I think the last chapter of your book is titled Hope. Um, where do you find it? <laughs> well, let me start in this room. Um, that the level of civic engagement we have seen across the United States in the past year, 2014 is the lowest turnout election since 1942, when millions of American men were overseas. 2016 was an election uh, conducted in a strong mood of looking for the lesser of, of two evils. I was really worried. Uh, when Donald Trump took office, that what we would see is that 2017 would be a year of Occupy Wall Street times a thousand. Um, unproductive gesture politics aimed at speaking to tiny little factional segments of American <coughs> life, flag burning, carrying the Mexican flag at demonstrations. Instead, what we have seen is people buying subscriptions to the New York Times, the, uh, Wall Street, uh, the Washington Post, to the Atlantic, our readership is up. NPR, KQED. NPR. People, people seek understanding the danger of disinformation and responding it uh, by seeking, by not taking the, I said, well, I'll read, you know, there's a lot of liberal leaning and disinformation on the, no, I'm gonna, go, I'm gonna go to the source. I want quality information about public affairs. That's tremendously heartening. I, I find it heartening that so many people are so shocked by the president's lying, and not just his big purposeful lies, but by his casual lies. Um, mightiest truth and destined to prevail is the, is the um, old Latin saying, and I think a lot of Americans are discover asserting that for, for themselves. Um, I see uh, encouragement in 
um, our, dis our willingness to pay attention to a lot of issues that got short shrift in 2015, the drug epidemic, what is happening to um, the economic prospects of Americans between the two wealthy coasts, and even on the wealthy coast, not everyone is doing so well. I mean, that, that tended to, we tended to lose sight of that in, in some past moments. That's at the center of the national conversation again, where, where it needs to be. Um, I think the discovery of so many American allies who have often chafed at American world leadership that they like it less when America is absent. Um, the discovery among people on the political left who would once have made heroes of the Julian Assanges and the Edward Snowdens, that you, threats come not only in the form of tanks and rockets, but also in clandestine forms, and you need the FBI, the CIA, and the NSA to do their work. And on, on the political right, among the Trump dissenters, to understand that a lot of the, the casual cruelties that you know, we, on the right are tempted to shrug off as just the way it is, together they add up to very large cruelties, and they can enable a very large and cruel presence at the very center of American government. All right, well, I'd like to remind the audience that uh, David will be down, or maybe gets back there, I guess, uh, with his uh, copies of his new book, Trumpocracy. They're available to buy. He'd be happy to sign one, I believe. Uh, our thanks to David Frum for joining us today at the Commonwealth Club, and thank you to our travel partner, United Airlines, for making this program happen. I'm Scott Schaefer, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club of California, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. Thanks.